Hey everybody, this is Tony Bancroft from the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast coming to you. I want you to listen to Master of One Podcast. I was on there. Loved it! Welcome to this Sandbox episode of the Master of One Podcast, part two for this week. This week we talked to filmmaker Patrick Willems. I'm Andrew, your Master of Art and Design. I'm Patrick, your Master of Television and Film. And I'm Luke, your Master of Toys and Games. So set your color grading to bright, because it's time for another episode. Nobody would ever do that. Sandbox episode, we are excited to talk to somebody who is notoriously misunderstood by the New Yorker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome filmmaker Patrick Willems to the show. Yep, yep, yep. Hey guys, happy to be here. You know, um, so we 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 talk uh, right before we started, we we were talking about how when you connected with the call, none of us were surprised because you, unlike a lot of people that we talked to, in fact, most of the people we talked to, your work involves you being in front of the camera a lot of the time. And so we've seen you, we've heard you. This feels very natural, almost as if I can ask you to, to borrow some money um, because I feel that comfortable. <laughs> with you. That that's your go-to. Like, that's when I know I'm comfortable with someone. Or yeah. like, as soon as I think I am, I'm just going to take money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you might as well establish that right away. Like, see if the person is comfortable with it. I and mean, what I'm do you like, have to lose, right? <laughs> beyond money. Yeah. And a friend. Well, I was going to say, maybe you should, you should check his job title because I don't know that filmmaker is up there with like highest, highest paying job when you're working your way up through the ranks. Well, I, I don't really know don't yet because so. we, we <laughs> haven't gotten through the episode. So um, for everybody out there who is not familiar with your work, why don't you give us a quick Wikipedia page about yourself? Let us know a little bit about who you are. All right. Well, I am a New York-based filmmaker and um, – and the vast majority of my filmmaking work is YouTube videos on my YouTube channel, which is named after me, but with my middle initial, the H in there, because the URL Patrick Willems was taken uh, back in 2011. And yeah, I've just been making YouTube videos for about the past six years that are pretty wide ranging, everything from like, um, you know, a lot of sort of like weird cinematic short films riffing on like uh, existing like movie genres, existing like, you know, well-known filmmakers, but also like video essays, like deconstructing and analyzing uh, movies. Just a lot of it usually comes back to movies and comic books to some extent. But um, but yeah, it's uh, that that was very rambling and semi incoherent. But um, <laughs> that's pretty much I still think what I do. Sure. Yeah. OK. So at the top of the show, we talked about uh, you being misunderstood by the New Yorker, and um, you gave us a little brief uh, snippet of that before we started. But we wanted to save the story story for the actual show. So tell us what happened with the New Yorker. So this was this was a very silly thing. Uh, back in I think November two thousand eleven, um, I released a video that was well earlier that year. Uh, there was. The, the big album, uh, the collaborative album between Kanye West and Jay-Z, uh, Watch the Throne. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm, a, I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of the album. And because it's like the sort of the biggest, most kind of like most like materialistic, like, you know, like grandiose, one of the most grandiose like pieces of music of the century, I thought yeah. it would be a fun like filmmaking challenge to try to create a dialogue scene made entirely from uh, from lines from that album yeah <laughs> and um but and then also to make it funnier to like make it look like a like sort of mumblecore like indie movie <laughs> and uh and so it's just like like three white girls in an apartment but having this like this conversation just like own that's like made only from lines from this album anyway as this kind of like framing device for the video was uh saying it was a scene from an upcoming release from ifc films yeah and like at the end of the video, there's like like a little outro that's like, you know, you know, oh, you know, click here to watch last week's video and stuff like that. And yet still, 
a lot of people thought it was a real thing. Oh, wow. And um, and the New Yorker put it on their website, writing it was a clip from an upcoming film from <laughs> IFC Films, so, directed by Patrick Willems. What wow. was your reaction to that? Like, is that exciting or was it scary? Oh, it, it was it was hilarious. It, it's one of it was maybe the funniest <laughs> thing that happened to me in all of that year. I like immediately called my dad while he was at work to be like, Dad, I'm in the New Yorker, but in a really weird way. <laughs> like I I'm in the New in Yorker, there. but but not really. <laughs> like right. Go look at it now before they pull it down. <laughs> oh my god. I know. And just the idea that like it took it would take like one click for them to immediately realize, oh, this is not a real thing. And they didn't do it. Wow. Like the, a publication that prestigious still put that on their site. Uh, yeah, because it would make me want to – it would make me think, yeah, a little bit of uh, research, <laughs> like one click would, would automatically fix that. Bare minimum. And – but the good news for you is you could actually end up being in the New Yorker twice because if they have to print a retraction, right? <laughs> I mean <laughs> your, your name's in there again. So that's, that's really true. all that – I don't think it was – in the actual magazine. I think it was just on the website. Okay. So, I mean, what is the, what's the equivalent to that? I know it wouldn't be printing a retraction, but would they post a retraction like, Hey, we messed up on this or would they just delete the post just and delete it? Would, is that I how that works? I, I think I checked back like a few years later and I just like, it popped in my head and I was like, I wonder if they ever fixed that. And it was still up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll Perfect. find the link. Patrick will find the link to it, we'll and it'll put it be on, on your show. resume. We'll it's check the way back there. machine. It'll be Don't there. Don't let that go bad. Like, yeah. Absolutely. So I want to give some context for where I know you from. Um, yes. We were in second grade together. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> wow, so I feel like you should have told me this before we started, Patrick. <laughs> no, uh, you did um, the What If Wes Anderson directed X-Men. That's I actually did. the first video I saw from you. And then, like, fast forward uh, a decent bit, I saw another video where you were talking about the uh, – the color correcting or color grading, whatever the term is in like Marvel films, which I know was a, a hot topic for sure. Something I, I didn't think it would be a hot topic. I thought that video was going to get zero views yeah. and, uh, and that no one would care. It did. I think and it got a couple million more than zero, didn't it? It did actually though. Yeah. Uh, after the Wes Anderson X-Men, it's the most popular video I've made. And, yes. uh, which was a, a, a big surprise. And, and so I think you you also have had the updates since then. Sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask what that translates to. You know, you, you, you expected zero. What did, what did you – what's the second highest um, viewing that you've ever seen? Like what is that? What's that number? Um, I think it's uh, – I checked like yesterday. I think it's at like 1.8 million, which Jeez. is – I mean it, in like the YouTube world, that's not massive. Sure. And uh, when, you know, like big YouTubers are re- releasing – like million view videos daily. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, it's big. And uh, yeah. and also just surprising because like it was the first video essay I'd ever made. And now I've made a, a lot more because of yeah. the success of that one. And, um, and yeah, it was just, it was really just, uh, you know, I wanted to try out that new kind of format. And I had been ranting about the color grading in Marvel's movies to my friends for like four years. And uh, so I was like, you know, I, I already have my whole argument like formed and uh i'll give this a shot no one's gonna watch it but whatever it's a video for that week and then that has honestly my last seven months were like radically shaped by the success of that video yeah so uh it yeah it is i didn't expect it to like change my career but it kind of did well so this is not where i was driving but let's keep that going so um, because I, when I first saw you, it was the either the 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 self like the the films for yourself, or like there were a few, I guess, the parodies and things like that. And then now, in recent months, it has been a lot of the video essays, and I, it's it's been capped off. At the last video you posted when we're sitting here uh, recording um, is the the video about uh, Edgar Wright and how he saved your career, and uh, and I think that. Um, maybe if we could start there, cause I think that makes a really good foundation for like, um, for, yeah, moving forward to where you are now. But then I think if we could come back and talk about that transition, because it has been very obvious, but I, I love the, the direction. So yeah, I, I think the Edgar Wright story would be a great place to start. Yeah, of course. Um, so this is going to be basically a, you know, shortened version of what my, sure. my, uh, my, my latest video was about, but, uh, basically I, I, I majored in cinema studies uh, in college, 
and um, which is basically like English, but instead of you know writing papers about books, you write papers about movies, and um, and uh, and I would like you know make movies and stuff like that. But there, there's no real set career path for filmmaking. You don't just get a job out of college, and so uh, and you know when I was finishing college, I was like I don't know how to get to do what I want to do. And so, because I was just afraid of like real world stuff, I decided to apply to, to like graduate film programs, not because I really wanted to go, but because I just, it was like, I'll just stay in school and then postpone the inevitable. And which is a bad reason to, uh, to, to apply to grad school. Sure. And so, so <laughs> I didn't get in and, um, I applied to like only like the three best ones in the country. So I like, and I, I, and I got waitlisted at, at one, at the one I liked the most. I still didn't get in. And then I went home. And then like at the end of that year, after I was out from college, I was like, well, I'll just apply to film school again. I don't have any better ideas. And, um, and once again, and, um, I got rejected from two. And then the one that I had gotten waitlisted at the previous year, uh, Columbia university, Uh I thought like this time, you know, if I got waitlisted last year, this time I'm going to get in. And, um, and I just got rejected like, like flat out. Not waitlist. Uh, not waitlist. Like I did worse than I did the previous year. And when and like at that point in my life, when I was like, you know, I would graduate from college. I was living at home. I had no idea how to get myself to the point where I could like make movies for a living. And uh, it was like just this crushing blow. It was like the lowest point I've had in like sure. many years. But like, um, I, I'd had an interview at Columbia that I thought went really well, and um. And, like, in my interview, they'd asked me to, like, talk about, uh, you know, what was, like, a, a great film I saw recently that I thought was really interesting. And I'm a giant fan of Edgar Wright's work. He's been, you know, one of, if not my favorite directors for uh, for many years. And um, I've been a huge fan of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, from uh, which came out the previous summer. And I talked, I talked a lot about that. Anyway, when I got home from the interview, um, I shot up a, a tweet about, uh, like, you know how like the key to a successful Columbia and a uh, film MFA interview is to just like talk about Edgar Wright and Scott Pilgrim a lot. And I tagged him in the tweet and he, he sent me uh, a DM on Twitter. That was just like, you know, that what he mentioned that he'd never gotten into any film school and uh-huh. been rejected from all of them. And, uh, and I was like, Whoa, that was really cool. And, uh, that he, you know, sent me a message. And so, uh, but then after I had gotten rejected myself from every film school I applied to, I like remembered that the previous month, I remember the thing he had sent me and I was like, and that's kind of how I got over that and decided to like get my act together and like move on and start doing something because I was like, wait, my favorite director went through the exact same thing and turned out okay. And so like, this is, this doesn't matter. Like, uh, like this is not really a big deal. So I should just start doing something. And so, yeah. And then I immediately just launched the YouTube channel and started just, uh, just making stuff independently and putting it on the internet. And, um, and that's been mostly what I've been doing for the past like six years. So, so that worked out for you. So that's great. So let's, let's, um, let's sit there for a second. Let's talk about Edgar Wright. Um, I actually talked about, uh, his, his new film, baby driver. I got the opportunity to see it, uh, pre-screen tomorrow. And I'm really <laughs> excited, uh, about the movie. And, when we found out, like when we, that we were talking to you and we knew that you were a big Edgar Wright fan, I wanted to talk to you about what it is about his films, um, that are inspirational to you. What do you pull from them? What techniques have you learned from him? What have you learned to maybe that you want to do differently because of him? Like, I just want to know about that infatuation because to say that he's possibly one of your, you know, your favorite director as a filmmaker, that is, that is a lofty praise, right? So what, what takes him there? Uh, do, do you have an hour? <laughs> we have as long as it takes. I, I we're mean, gonna I, edit it to thirty seconds, but we're, you can talk as long as you. <laughs> it's actually it's convenient that you ask this now because there's a point in that video I made where I did like I had when I was like writing the script I was like I've gotta summarize like why like discovering his his work was like a big deal and I've got to put that like in like a like word it concisely so I already figured out how to do that. And so, because I mean, like, I was 16 when Shaun of the Dead uh, was released, and I yeah. saw it in theaters, yeah. and um, and it just like came out of nowhere for me. I just I knew it was like a British zombie comedy that had gotten good reviews, and um, and it just happened to like like personally, it managed to like sort of synthesize like 
all my interests and sensibilities and my sense of humor. Like I was just like on its wavelength completely. And, uh, and so, and like, and so there was that. And, and so I, like, I loved like all the service level stuff, but the fact that like it did all this, you know, this really, really funny, interesting stuff and had this really like this like hyper kinetic style with like real craft behind it. And, um, but it was all built on this foundation of like, fantastic storytelling and character work. And so, so it, it, it literally, and you can say this of all his, his movies and of spaced the, uh, the TV show he directed before mm-hmm. Shaun of the dead, like, um, it works on so many levels and everything he's ever made. It gets better with each viewing because they're so meticulously put together. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, and I, I know there's a reason that he's been so influential for like my generation of, of movie nerds and filmmakers because, uh, you know, uh, they're some of the only comedies that have like real, that are like visually dynamic, that have serious like craft behind them. And so, you know, you can, you know, so they're really entertaining and fun and you laugh a lot at them, but right. then there's also like, Oh my God, like I want to study this shot by shot mm-hmm. and like, look at how this is put together because it's like virtuosic. So yeah. I can. I should probably just stop there. But um, I hope yeah, Baby like, Driver's good. I would. I would feel terrible after hearing all that if you like hated the film. Yeah, I would we just. We, just, we do a follow up. He feels so bad. We do a follow up, but he's like, oh no. <laughs> can we edit out all that stuff I said about Edgar Wright? Uh, I'm going to switch to Wes Anderson now. <laughs> I'm also a fan of him. Uh, okay, so I want to go back to YouTube. So talk a little bit about how you've grown since you started the channel. I congratulations. You're at 120,000, something like that now, right? Followers. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. Um, the, the wild thing though, as I should say is seven months ago after five and a half years of doing this, it was at 18,000. Yeah. That's crazy. So this is a, there's so a lesson learned. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it finally is like, it, it only became like profitable like this year. Sure. Sure. Well, okay. So talk about, so I watched your, your hundred thousand video and, uh, you talk a little bit about the journey of, of what you did when you started and then kind of where you are now. So maybe summarize that and then just tell us like how you approach learning all the ins and outs and, and some of that growing pains of trying to make content happen routinely. Yeah. Well, when I started back in, 2011 and um, I was in my hometown I didn't move to New York City until like the beginning of 2012 and so um and but thing is I had been making movies all through high school like yeah. at the end of high school beginning of college I made like a trilogy of feature length films which uh they're not they're not good but uh but, <laughs> yeah, but that's, a, that's a lot of work you, that's but fine. you made them it is but but those um like making those really like taught me how to do everything. Yeah. That was my film school, essentially. Yep. Just, you know, putting myself in the situation where, especially because um, I, like, founded in high school, like, the uh, the film club and, like, a film festival. Mm-hmm. And so and so we would make these movies and, like, hype them up. And so and people would watch them. And so I kind of had, you know, so, like, uh, I really, you know, kind of got started because I would, I, like, made a, a movie and then, like, announced a sequel to it and then had people in my town waiting on it. And so that put the pressure on me to deliver this thing. And then I was like, okay, I've decided to make a 90 minute long movie and everyone is waiting for it. So I've got to learn how to just do that with no crew. Yeah. And, um, but what I, and, but through that, um, so I've been used to just like making stuff independently. And I had this big network of actors, just people I knew in my hometown. So I started making YouTube videos that were just like, you know, these like weird little short films every week. I already had this huge cast just ready to go and everyone was home for the summer. And, um, and so, so I was doing that and, uh, and yeah. And, and that first year of making YouTube videos, it was just, it was like weekly. They were every Wednesday, there was a new video. And then things kind of changed a little bit when I moved to New York city, because it's just, uh, you know, it's just harder to make videos here. Yeah. And uh, I'm in like a, I'm in a new place and I uh, got to adjust to the city and, uh, and suddenly the videos stopped being weekly and they were, they did not become weekly again until the end of last year. Okay. And so the videos would come out like every three or four weeks or so. And I still had like a team in the city that I would work with, but the goal really became, um, as I'd gotten a little bit 
more focused and better at making the videos, trying to make big videos that would get attention and lead to new opportunities. Yeah. And, um, and that was really it. And so, so there's a lot of videos like, you know, that will riff on existing like pop culture stuff and, um, a lot of like geek culture related things, movies and comic books. And, um, because those would just, were way more likely to get attention than, you know, original stuff. And I wouldn't make just like original non IP related videos, but just knowing that those wouldn't do as well, but I wanted to make them for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, skip ahead to 2015, um, the Wes Anderson X Men, which uh, I you know I put more like time and effort and money into than any other video because sure. I was like I think this is a good idea and if I do it right it will be a hit yeah and uh, and it was it, uh, it the video did really well and it got a lot of attention and it led to all these cool meetings at different companies something I was like developing projects and like web series and stuff like that talking to TV producers and I was like okay. I've made it. Like, this is it. This is like, oh, we're going to be making stuff with money now. Like, uh, finally, it all paid off. And then every one of those things fell apart oh. or just like, just, you know, just dissolved. And uh, yeah. And uh, it was so like 2015 was kind of like a, a bummer as it went on because I kept waiting for like the green light. And then I get the call like, yeah, man, sorry. Like, the uh, like the vice president of production just like thinks this one's too risky. We're not going to do it. Yeah. And, um, and so anyway, so then like 2016, I'm kind of back at square one and, uh, you know, and I realized like, I don't have any other ideas that are, you know, going to be as big a hit as the Wes Anderson X-Men. So I kept making videos, but I just didn't know what the next step was. And, um, and so at the end of last year, I kind of just took a break for a couple months and then, uh-huh. um, uh, I kind of like just re just like to look at YouTube and kind of reevaluate like how I wanted to approach it. And, um, I decided to just try out, um, instead of focusing on making every video, like a potential huge hit, just trying to, uh, be consistent and release content on like a weekly schedule yeah. and see if, you know, maybe try that for a few months, see if anything happened. And I also knew that I couldn't make a little like cinematic short film every single week because those are hard to produce. Sure. So I was like, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add nonfiction content. Like I'll try a video essay, some vlogs where I talk about filmmaking just to, you know, make sure that there's one every week. And suddenly like, um, I realized that after years of assuming there was no audience for me talking about movies at length on the internet, I discovered that there was. Mm. And, uh, and I also discovered that people really like video essays. And so, and so like, the new nonfiction content and the uh, the like new weekly schedule really th- those two things kind of converged and just took off and it's just been growing rapidly since yeah. then. So and that's that's my entire YouTube story. Sorry, no, 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 that's oh. perfect. That's great. So talk talk a little bit about one of those questions that popped up for me was you had a crew and you mentioned you had like this group of people you had actors and everything back home and then you moved to <clears> New York. Did you I have brought pe- some of them with me? Okay, so they some people came with you, and uh, yeah, what was it like? You know, adding people to that. How did you find more people in the city? You yeah, know? Um, I already had friends living in the city. Okay, and then um, and I moved down to the city with some of my hometown friends who I already worked on videos with. Gotcha. And uh, so I didn't have as many uh, like collaborators there, but um, but then like once I got there you know, the group kind of grew and I, you know, more friends from college moved to the city. Uh, I like, I made, you know, new friends to other people. And so now in the city I've got, um, for pretty much from all my videos, I've got, uh, I have three friends that I, uh, I write with uh-huh. and, uh, we have like weekly, uh, writing meetings and, um, often done over Skype just like this. Yeah. And, uh, where, you know, I'll be like, okay, these are the ideas that I want to talk about. Let's sort of flesh these out. And then, you know, at the end of the meeting, we'll like assign scripts to people. And, um, and so we do the writing that way. And then I just have this big network of actors. And, uh, I know a lot of my stuff has been sort of nonfiction this year. That's largely sure. because I've been sort of out of town a lot. Uh-huh. And so I can produce these like totally on my own. Yeah. But, I, uh, but so, but for the summer, like we literally just were up on the roof of this building I'm in, um, with like a guy in a Spider-Man costume, hmm. um, uh, shooting, uh, you know, a new narrative short. And so what I'm aiming for with the schedule, um, is like, I want each month to ideally have two narrative shorts, one video essay, 
and one vlog about filmmaking sure. stuff. Sure. And that's, that's the, like the schedule that I, I really like yeah. and like the balance of, of different styles. Yeah. So I, I want to, um, so there's this idea and, and I, I think this has been illustrated pretty well, uh, so far in your career at two big moments. One, one was that second, um, rejection, um, letter where you had to say, um, I guess objectively, or, or at least on paper, I have now managed to go backwards in my talent and skill over the course of a year. Um, and then, and so there was just this moment of like, yeah, well, you're very familiar with the moment. And then there's this no, another <laughs> portion of, um, you've been spending five and a half years working on this and, um, and haven't necessarily seen the, the, payoff when it comes to engagement from people you have something big like the uh, x-men short which which is huge and then you're kind of stuck again going well okay but again i'm not really sure what to do <laughs> and i i don't right. know like the next step to take so that seems like two big moments where y- you know your career could have very easily gone a completely different direction or or maybe even you know uh ceased on some level so ha- how do you how, how do you handle that? Like, how do you have that moment and how do you convince yourself to go back out and do something else? Uh, I think at least for me, it's largely just kind of like this single minded focus on the, the, just one goal. Sure. And, uh, and it's been the same like end goal since I was in high school. And it's like, you know, there's no backup plan. And, uh, which, might not be the smartest thing to say, but, uh, but yeah, but just like that, it's like failure isn't an option. Yeah. Like, you know, there, there's, if this thing didn't work out, I'll find a, you know, another way to get there, but that's it. It's like, you know, I will, you know, if I don't get, get to like, a, if I don't get to the point where I'm like making a living, uh, doing filmmaking on some level, that will be massively disappointed to me. And uh, sure. I just got to make sure I can find a way to make it happen. So it's a matter of just, you know, in, in each of those cases, it's like there's especially the, uh, the like the film school rejection. There's like it's this setback that's like really like disheartening. And uh, and then just, you know, kind of letting it fade over a couple days and then just being like, OK, just all it's like, let's let's move on because you have to get there. Yeah. And right. Now it's time to, to like find a, like a new route to get there. So this is this is what you do full time now, right? The sort of um, my my I guess like day job all these years has just been freelance video work. Okay. Okay. And um, that's been mostly it. But uh, and and, th- and I, I still do that. Like I had a gig like two weeks ago. And, Everybody um, listening relates very well to the term freelance. We oh, yeah, are, yes. absolutely. We're all there with you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so that's been and uh, I started doing freelance video work right around the same time I started the YouTube channel. And, um, so that this whole time, that's what I've been doing. And, uh, but yeah, but honestly, like, I, th- I think I mentioned the, the YouTube channel did not become profitable until like the last few months. Yeah. And, um, and now, and my goal is to have it be, you know, like a, my primary source of income by the end of the year. And, um, if it keeps growing the way it is, that's feasible, you know, things could get derailed or whatever, but, um, but yeah, but it's only, but like for years I lost money on YouTube because I'd be spending money buying like props and costumes and stuff sure. like that. And um, I was like, that's okay. This is worth it. And um, I just take the money from the video work and put it into this. And now suddenly YouTube is, you know, actually bringing in money and it, it's blowing my mind. So yeah. uh, this is all new to me. So it's I amazing wanna... when passion <laughs> meets your wallet. That's mm-hmm. a nice feeling. <laughs> Exactly. It's also the closest thing I've, I've ever seen to a salary because yeah. freelance is so inconsistent. You know, I'm sure. so used to like nagging clients about like, hey, I haven't received the paycheck yet. Uh, when, you know, is he going to send that? And um, and with YouTube, it's like I know what day of the month I'm going to get paid on. Yeah. I can look at, at the analytics and be like, oh, that's how much I get paid this month. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's like I'm like, oh, I, you know, this this is really appealing. I see why, why people have like uh, salary jobs. This is yeah. really nice. You know, <laughs> what, what you're going to get. Oh, well, that's what a budget is. Yeah. <laughs> so 
so then in that case, um, for the YouTube, the, the thing that you've been doing lately, you've, you've used the term video essay. And what this is, you take these uh, concepts. Now, this could be um, filmmaking concepts or this. I, I think it seems that it's a lot of things that um, I think there are topics that you probably sit around like a dining room table and talk about with your friends. And then you're like, I might as well just film the conversation. But but like an example is you talked about uh, the fixation on realism with films or, or just this idea that that people attach the need for, for realism to their films and to their viewing experience. And then you actually break down what does that actually mean in, in real terms and what are examples on, you know, this end of the spectrum and that end of the spectrum. You talk about um, kind of the, the, the dumb comedy uh, and, and the difference between, uh, I, do you use the term smart dumb comedy or something? Smart like dumb that? comedy, yeah. Yeah, and, and what that actually looks like, uh, like well-written dumb comedy as opposed to just, you know, the other end of the spectrum. Um, so you take these topics and you, you take these really deep dives. So I would be curious um, from your perspective of the topics that you've worked in, uh, do you have a, a favorite one, one that, that was just, you know, even more so like a, a passion for you to finally get to like flesh out in fuller form. And then I'd also be interested, what is that topic that's like still sitting at the back of your head? That's maybe like not quite a fully formed thought, but you like it's in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I, you really kind of hit the nail on the head when you said, like, these are things that I, like, I sit around the table and talk to my friends about. Because, like, the first video essay I made was the Marvel color grading one. And that was just what I've been complaining about to my friends, I think, like, since the, the first Avengers came out. And, uh, just, like, like, these movies are good, but, like, why do they have this, like, flat, bland, uh, like, color palette? And, um, and, yeah, and pretty much the way these, these things go, like, with the video essays, it's just... Um, you know, I'm finally, it's still funny to me because like I was a cinema studies major in college where I had to write all these papers on movies and I didn't enjoy it. And I would put all the papers off until like the, the night before they were due and sure. then, like not even proofread them. <laughs> and, um, and now I'm, I'm like willingly like, you know, just writing multiple drafts of essays on film. Yeah. And uh, it, I guess it took like six years away from college to realize it I didn't sounds find scholarly. It. Like this is like if you haven't heard one of these, there'll be some in the show notes. Go listen to one because this is like a deep dive. It, it's like sitting in a film class for fifteen minutes. Yeah, and um, and maybe it's because you know, like I guess out, I realize I don't mind it outside of the uh, you know the academic environment. But um, but yeah, it's usually just like picking like topics, the kind of things that I would just like on my own, just sit there obsessing over or like doing research on or just thinking about at length. <laughs> and, uh, and what I'm trying to do is just take these things that like I care a lot about, I'm enthusiastic about. And then, um, cause that, that's the thing. Like I don't want to do them if I don't, if I'm not very invested in each of these topics. Sure. Yeah. And then just, um, and, um, and thinking like, is this, you know, like these all relate to, to filmmaking or cinema in some way. And they're usually, there's a lot of video essays on movies out there. And, uh, and generally with these, uh, you know, I'm trying to find something that's like uh, a lot of them just like, you know, there are things other people have not really explored before. And I think like I think it's interesting. No one else has talked about it. I think I'm going to talk about it. Yeah. And um, and yeah, the one that I that I think is my favorite of all of them is I, I'm really proud of the one on David Fincher's music videos. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen that one. So that's that's like what I'm doing after this interview. Yeah, because there's there's a lot of video essays on David Fincher because he's one of those directors that like really like you know really came to prominence in the '90s that people of my generation like you know like young film nerds are really into. Mm -hmm. He's like you know he's like I guess mainstream, but also has a very distinctive style and is good at what he does. Yeah. But before he made movies, he made he was like the biggest music video director in the world. And I like music videos a lot. And I really care about music video editing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of music videos are badly edited. And uh, and Fincher not only is great at it. I mean, you know, his movies have won like multiple editing Oscars. Like he's good at that. But uh, but his music videos were really well edited. And he kind of like and uh, almost like set like the gold standard for how those things are put together. And I've never seen any critical writing mm -hmm. about those topics. And so it's like this like 10 minute video where uh, I just really like deep dive into like the, the craft and like camera movements and editing of like uh, the videos for like Vogue by Madonna and uh, <laughs> Freedom by George Michael. And uh, yeah. 
they're just, they're just like great pop videos. And because uh, like everyone talks about like Spike Jones videos and Michelle Gondry videos, which are great. Yeah. But like Fincher was like making these astoundingly like well crafted videos. And I guess because they were just like, you know, for pop music, no one's ever like talked about them critically. Sure. So yeah, so I, I, I really like how that one turned out. Awesome. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but these uh, all of these videos are accredited, right? So you can just watch these, and at the end, you will personally send them a degree in a film study, right? Exactly, exactly. That, that's how. It <laughs> that's works. what I read yeah. in the Unor- in the New Yorker, by the way. <laughs> well, no, you have to watch all his videos, and then also send in one hundred eighty thousand oh, dollars. Yeah, but yeah. then yeah, he yeah, will yeah. then he will send. I it thought to that you, was so. a given, Patrick. So look, here's what I want to do. I want to <laughs> shift us into our finals. We want to be cognizant of your time and keep this bite sized for everybody. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to jump in with my question. You have a video out there and, and there's this whole other love besides film that we haven't touched on. I want to touch on it for just a moment and maybe we'll do another whole episode with you to just talk about this. But um, you love comics and do. you do this video and you make this assertion right off the bat within like the first 60 seconds of this of this uh, video. You say, I love comics and everyone out there can love them, too. And that's your assertion. And that's a bold assertion because so many people, comics get such a bad rap in the literary, in the literary, literary, literary. Luke's going to edit that so that I sound smart. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, make sure you leave in literary. (laughs) Shut up. Um, In the literary world, comics get a bad rap, right? And so uh, talk to us about that. What is what do you mean by that? What's your I know that you go to break that down in the video, but give us a give us a snippet, just a little taste of what that is. And then we'll direct people to the video where they can see everything else. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the video is uh, the, the how to get into comic books. video. Yep. And um, yeah. And uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I have been reading comics since I was like four years old. And um, and at that time in like the 90s, that was at the point when, you know, and for many really until like recent years, the medium was just, you know, frowned upon in, in like, you know, popular, you know, in mainstream culture. Right. And, um, and I, you know, I spent many years like through like middle school and some of that being like a closeted comic book fan because it was just like socially unacceptable to like be into them. And, uh, and so I was very used to that, but then over like, you know, in this century, you know, as like, comic book adaptations have, like, slowly come to dominate popular culture, um, at some point or another, like, pretty much all my friends have, have come to me and, like, expressed an interest in, like, reading them and getting into them. This, and I've gone through this so many times with so many people. And, um, and so, yeah, and I've realized that, like, you know, once you get past that, that stigma that, you know, culture and society, like, imposed upon the medium, like, pretty much everyone you know, has like, you know, once they've got the right recommendation, everyone enjoys them. It's I mean, like, you know, like everyone enjoys some, some movie or some music or some book. It's just another medium. And, uh, and there's something for everyone. I, I am terrified. I, I am terrified. Like you, you, in the video, you talk about the, uh, uh I can't remember the, the character's name from the Simpsons, but the comic book store owner. And, yeah, he uh, yeah, oh, he's and just the, co- the comic book. Uh, then I'm, comic I'm glad book. I couldn't think yeah. of it. Perfect. Um, I'm glad I didn't give a name for him. Yeah. That would have been you know more Dennis, right? Th- that Simpsons <laughs> character who's the comic book store owner. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's what I imagine. Like I'm I'm literally like scared to go into a comic book shop because I just feel like I'm gonna obviously not fit in and I'm gonna be shamed right back out the door. He's afraid of the barrier of entry, and what he realizes, wow. what he doesn't realize is the barrier of entry you claim is very very low, as long as you get the right recommendation. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's the thing. Like I, you know, any of the comic shops that I frequent constantly when I'm there, I see new people coming in, going to the employees saying, Hey, uh, I, I kind of want to read something about like this character and they're, they're, they're brand new at it. And the employees are really helpful and they're just, and they're just dedicated to just getting more people into comics. And, um, and yeah, and I mean, there, there are like, I do hear some stories about like, you know, uh, comic book stores that will like, you know, condescendingly, uh, like, you know, dismiss, like, you know, sure. New readers. Yeah. But, but they're, they're pretty uncommon now. Like most of them are very, 
welcoming. Yeah. I think and, what uh, is helpful is that elitism is would would make the uh, if they embrace elitism, it will just make the art form obsolete and people will stop doing it. I think they realize well, hopefully they'll just drive themselves out of business. That's exactly that's what yeah. I'm saying. Those yeah. people, <laughs> they, they make themselves uh, they realize the error of their ways after they've done that too, one too many times. Exactly. It's not it, it's 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 daunting because, like I said in the video, you know, it's like uh, it's not like getting into a genre or an author. It's getting into a medium, and sure. so there's so much there. But uh, but like you know, if you just have like a, a bit of guidance, or which can even just be you know, the like the clerk at a comic book store, there's no reason everyone you know shouldn't be reading and enjoying comics. Yeah, yeah, uh, love it. Okay, so I will go into my final. I, I'm going to ask two small ones. First is, who's your favorite comic character? Character? Yeah. Uh, it's, I feel like this is so cliche, but probably Batman. That's awesome. That's fine. That, What's wrong with that? I mean, that, that's like, like the entire reason I ended up the way I did was because I was four years old. My parents showed me the, the 60s Batman movie with Adam yeah. West. Yeah. And that just... That began an obsession with Batman. That began an obsession with comics. That became an obsession with movies. Yep. And um, it all started there. No, that's and, great. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's probably it. Okay. So, yeah, that was a real quick one. Now, my, my final question is, if you were handed uh, any franchise to make a movie. Oh, I got, I, I got this. Where, what is it? I got this. Uh, my dream comic book adaptation to direct is Batman Beyond. Okay. Yeah. And uh, which... It's not even my favorite cartoon. I like uh-huh. the cartoon. Sure. I think it might be the weakest of like the the DC animated universe shows. Okay. Um, but it combines so many things that I love. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it, it's like it's like Batman. What well, the thing is, in that Batman is pretty much Spider Man. Uh huh. It's like the same kind of character. So it's basically like Spider Man, but he's Batman, and he's in a Blade Runner city. Yeah. With Akira style biker gangs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's like teen drama and, and just like, you know, Patrick and, sold now you had him at teen drama. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, look, I, I made a web series called Aquaman, the teen drama. Yeah. Like I, I am, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that stuff. And so, so it's just, it's so many of my, and all of my favorite things just combined. Yeah. And, um, and also because there's been a lot of Batman movies, mm-hmm. but this is different enough that it wouldn't be like, so compared to all the others. Sure. And, um, and I'm just like, that's just like my dream thing. I've, I've like put thought into like who I would want to be like the cinematographer on it, who I'd want to do the music. Yeah. Like that is, that is my, dr- like, uh, I don't think about this stuff too much, sure. but that is my dream project. Awesome. So you said the, uh, word weakest and then the other, uh, word DC in the same sentence. Um, <laughs> what's, what's happening there? What, what, why, why the imbalance in the, uh, the two, the two, like Marvel versus DC. What are, what are your thoughts? Where's the misstep? I, I I have a whole like 13 minute long video about this. Uh, um, I mean, if you really want to go to like the heart of it, it all began with uh, you know Marvel taking it slow and planning their uh, their universe well and uh, and having one guy overseeing everything. And with DCs, it was desperately trying to play catch up with mm-hmm. no singular, you know, person running it, and uh, and just rushing into it and making bad creative decisions. But uh, Wonder Woman was a massive step in the right direction. And, yeah, no uh, kidding. That's a good movie. Yeah, no, it is. It is, it is, it is, it is. good. I, I agree with good. But I'm a bit. I'm a. I'm going to be honest. Like I'm looking at the reviews, and I and I've seen that. We've all seen the film. And uh, and then I'm comparing it to some similar similarly reviewed uh, like Marvel films and or like um, also thinking of like Dark Knight and films like that. I'm having a little bit of trouble. I still think there's a little bit of a mismatch there. I don't know if you feel the same way. Really? Uh, I mean, I, I've read a lot of reviews, <clears throat> and the overall consensus is extremely positive. Oh, I know and that. I'm not disagreeing with that, and I certainly think it was a good film. I'm having right. a, a bit of trouble with like. I, again, comparing it to similarly reviewed films, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that it was. Okay. What's a, what's a me. similarly reviewed film that we can, I think, just I think the, the, the dark Knight is, is uh, sitting at the same place, isn't it? Um, well, I, maybe in terms of like a rotten tomato score, but I mean, a big thing is also like, 
you know, oftentimes with the D series, the second movie is vastly superior to the first one. Like the first one, it like has to like, the key thing is getting the character and the world right. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and then the set, like, you know, look, look at the Nolan Batman movies. Batman begins. It's good. And, um, it still got devolved into kind of like generic, uh, you know, like superhero y third act, but it's, it's good. And then the second one, since they had like the groundwork laid, they made something much better. Yeah. And, um, and so I predict the same thing will happen here. And, uh, I'm just like, it, it this was the movie I, I was like so afraid they would get wrong, especially mm. with their track sure. record. And I'm so relieved that they got it right. Like, if oh yeah, them, this was the one they had to get right. And it's just like they they need to put they, all their eggs in it. this basket for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I, it's I would I was concerned how they would recover if this movie had not done well. Just what that would mean for the oh, universe yeah. as a whole. Oh yeah, because I I really don't like the the previous three movies. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. And and I think and honestly I think that uh, fans were were really having trouble holding on. Uh, so I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad that it did do well. Uh, and again I've seen the film. It is a good film. Um, okay, so that none of that was my question. That's all going to oh, cut good. out. No one will hear that. Um, just kidding. Um, so I I would be curious about the role of education uh, because you do have formal education. Um, and you obviously do put a lot of research into what you do. I mean, learning is obviously very important and, and it, it really has to be to do well at what you're doing now. Um, but I know that you also made the comment at the beginning of the interview that, you know, those kind of like three full length films that you made in that high school, college transition or in that time period, that was really your film school. So right. I'd be curious, um, your opinion on learning and, and what formal education has done for you and, and how kind of necessary you, you feel that is on, on this end? That's a, that's a really good question because there's the constant debate about, you know, is film school important? And, uh, like, is it, is it worth all that? And granted, I didn't really technically go to film school. You know, I studied cinema studies, uh, which was, you know, at, at a liberal arts college. And I spent a semester studying abroad at a, like, strict film school, but that was just one semester. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think the education really like the importance of education for. Are, are you talking like just for specifically for filmmaking? Well, I, in this case, yes, because that would be your experience. So yes, right. Yeah, I mean, I think it varies depending on the person. Like for me, um, it wouldn't like I, uh, you know, obviously I applied to like graduate film programs, but looking back, you know, I'm glad I didn't go, and I don't think that. And not in a way of like, oh, I'm just really good and don't need that at all. But uh, but like, I don't think that would have been a smart thing for me because I learned so much of the practical stuff about just like, you know, trying to to just make a movie and um, and dealing with problems and and all the stuff that, that comes with that and just the process of it, just through by putting myself in this insane experience back in like 2000, like six and seven of like deciding I was going to make these no budget feature length films they, and they were like action movies yeah. so they're with car chases and stuff like that. And, uh, and just figure it all out. And the biggest thing I, I got out of that was just because every possible problem would arise at some point, everything. And, um, and I just had to deal with all of them. And then that just trained me for, you know, doing the same thing on like a slightly larger scale and, sure. um, and so, so, um, after getting all of that, because I just, I learned all like, you know, all the, yeah, just like, you know, I, I learned the craft and I learned the, uh, you know, how to deal with the process of production and all of that. And then in what was helpful for me was in college, the, the cinema study stuff, like studying film theory, like analyzing, uh, films, stuff like that. I gained a lot from that and, and just, you know, teaching me to look at the medium in new ways. Mm. And, uh, and I got a lot from that, but, um, so yeah, it was, for me, it was like the combination of the both of both. It was like the, the independent production stuff and then the very academic film theory, cinema study stuff that, uh, that those, that yeah, that's what really helped me. Man. All right. So I think, um, a lot of good nuggets in there, a lot of great stuff. Tell everybody where they can find you on the web, how they can support what you're doing. Um, before we head over to our tokens. 
Of course, uh, all of my stuff is on YouTube at youtube.com slash Patrick H. Willems. Uh, if you just Google Patrick Willems, it'll come up. It's, uh, it, it's very easy to find. And, um, and yeah, I'm, and I'm on all the social medias at, again, as Patrick H. Willems. Um, I've got a Patreon mm-hmm. so people can support me, but cool. you know, check out the videos before yeah. we're going to that. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Awesome. Well, um, would you do us a favor before we head out of here and help us pick our categories for next week? Sure. That sounds amazing. All right, so that's it for the interview portion. Up next, we're going to draw some tokens. The token section every week is when we find out exactly the categories we are going to be using next week for our Master Category episode that comes on Tuesdays. We're going to find this out randomly. I've got three tokens. I'm going to put them face down. I'm shuffling them up right now. Give me a number between one and three, and you'll be picking for Patrick. Yep. Three. Patrick, you've got TV and film, my friend. All Congratulations. Right. Good, because I'm All seeing right. Baby Driver. Uh, I'll be able to talk about that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're funny. Um, okay, I've got two tokens left. Give me a number between one and two. <laughs> one or two. One. <laughs> one. Luke, you've got toys and games. I mean, I have art awesome. and design. We all got our own category. All right. Did it. Did it, everybody. That, that hasn't happened in a minute. I know. Congratulations. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being on, Patrick. Go check out all of his stuff. His videos are great. Um, it, just go support what he's doing. This is uh, the first seven months of this year have been great. Let's make the next uh, five even better. Um, let's get him to his goal by the end of the year, right? We want to be fully supported by by YouTube, right? That, that's what you said your goal was? That's it. That would be great. We're going to get yeah. it there. Every If every listener goes right now, that's going to push you beyond that goal. You're going to be buying a house in uh, Cabo before before you know it. Um, as for us, you can find us on M of one podcast.com where you can find show notes and links to all the stuff we talked about in this episode, as well as an entirely too long list of incredibly awesome people to listen to. I mean, if you were to listen to every interview episode that we've done at this point, um, how many days of, of listening would that be at this point? I mean, a, a week's worth. Yeah, almost, probably. probably it's a lot. So go listen to incredibly talented people. Um, talk about what they do and how they do it. It's it's a great, great thing. And then support those guys. Um, you can find us on uh, Slack as well, where we have an incredible community of creatives, entrepreneurs, doers, thinkers, amazingly talented people in there day in and day out, conversing and coming together as a community. Uh, just go to mofonepodcast.com slash Slack to join that community. Um, and then you can also find us on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash mofonepodcast and you can support the show there. Find Financially, for as little as a dollar, you can become a patron. For five bucks, you get to be part of the blooper um, group, tier, whatever it is. Yeah, the, and, old, uh, the old blue group. Well, the old blue. The old blue. Um, Nobody says that. The blue. Um, and, uh, and, and you get a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So, um, go hop in on there and, and join that party as well. Uh, and then you can find us all over social media. Just search M of one podcast, connect with us on there. Um, we like to see you. We want to talk to you and then go to iTunes and subscribe. That way you never miss an episode, two episodes every single week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we will come straight to your eel, eel, eel holes. What's an eel hole? Is that like what happens in the coral? <laughs> nobody nobody like talks eel. about eel holes. Oh, is that, is that why it doesn't sound familiar? Okay. Well, we come twice a week is what I was trying to say, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, but once you've subscribed, Patrick, what's the next step? Rate and review. That's right. It just takes you a few seconds to do. It does us a lot of good. We'll read your review on the air. And uh, much like Ron Burgundy, you, we will read anything you put in front of us. Yep, give us a question mark. We'll end it on an inflation. Hey, we're going to get out of this episode. I'm Andrew. I'm Patrick. I'm Luke. I'm Patrick. Peace out. Bye. Hold on to your butts. Later, guys. Later, guys.